At the age of 77, Thomas Jefferson reflects that he and his colleagues went down to the Raleigh Tavern to write a resolution encouraging all the other colonies to form committees of correspondence. But he's 77 and he can't really remember all the people who were there. I wish there was another source. Oh wait, I work at Colonial Williamsburg. I can go down to the Raleigh Tavern and just ask Patrick Henry what he thinks. Mr. Henry, thank you so much for making the time to see me. It is my pleasure. Now, Mr. Henry, as you may be aware, we're about on the 250th anniversary of the formation of the Committees of Correspondence. Mm. And I understand you played a really important role in the formation of those committees. So I wonder if you could tell us what Committees of Correspondence were and how you thought about these committees back in 1773. We believed that unity was absolutely essential were we to preserve our precious rights as free-born Englishmen. Communication was few and far between uh, in those days, and it was through communication that we were going to be able to fulfill our aim. Yeah, my understanding is, is that colonies might communicate with each other, but a lot of that communication went through newspapers. Oh, yes. Uh, in addition to sending letters as to what was overheard or what was witnessed, uh, newspapers were generally uh, sent along to other people, uh, under other places too. Now during our research of committees of correspondence, we stumbled upon the papers of your colleague in the House of Burgesses, Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Oh, yes. And at the age of 77, Mr. Je Jefferson reflected that it was you, he, Richard Henry Lee, Francis Lightfoot Lee, and Mr. Dabney Carr who gathered right here in the Raleigh Tavern to discuss a need for every colony to have a committee correspondent. Quite so. In the Daphne Room, in fact, in the Raleigh Tavern on the main street in Williamsburg. Is that where we are now? Yes, this very room. So very right room. here, you guys were gathered and talked about this resolution. So what did you talk about that night here in the Raleigh Taverns? The Gaspé incident in 17 and 72 was fresh upon everyone's mind. The idea that uh, we in America would be transported to England for a fair trial it was something that was deeply concerning. So we, uh, we figured that it was only through unity and by increased uh, communications that we would be able to preserve our precious rights. We also discussed the uh, reliability of the existing postal service and the formation of uh, perhaps better lines of, uh, of getting news from here to places such as Philadelphia to Boston and, and uh, so on. Why did you choose to meet here in Raleigh Tavern rather than right down the street at the Capitol here in Williamsburg? Forming these committees had something of an extra legal taste. So we thought that it would be uh, more suitable to meet in the Raleigh Tavern. It was the preeminent establishment in Williamsburg at the time. And Mr. James Suttle, the proprietor, was a friend to our cause. It just made sense. Did you ever worry about your participation in events like trying to organize a committee of correspondence since it was viewed by so many in the colonies as a, a suspect event, as you put it? Yes. I had the uh, cries of treason hurled in my direction from the time of the Stamp Act on. And it was only a two, two years later after the formation of the committees of correspondence that I had a price on my head. So yes, there was a, a bit of worry, but the price of, uh, of one's own uh, person, one's own being, is uh, certainly not going to outweigh the drive for liberty. So that reminiscence that I mentioned that Mr. Jefferson had in his papers about the formation of the Committees of Correspondence, he notes that on March 11, 1773, you meet here in the Raleigh Tavern. You create this resolution, and then on March 12, 1773, you go down the street to the House of Burgesses. And Mr. Dabney Carr presents the resolution to the House of Burgesses. Yes. I mean, forgive me, Mr. Henry, but you're the man who would go on to say, give me liberty or give me death. I mean, you're a fiery speaker, convincing speaker. How come you didn't present the resolution? Well, Mr. Carr presented it in a very eloquent fashion, and we thought it uh, 
we thought it best to preserve our real fire for the following day. Uh, I did speak out in favor of the formation of these committees the following morning, and uh, the day after that, Mr. Richard Henry Lee had some choice words to say in favor of it. It was a deliberately uh, and well-planned uh, stratagem. When you're in the House of Burgesses and Dabney Carr is presenting this resolution before the House of Burgesses, how did your fellow Burgesses react? Ultimately, when the vote was taken, it was unanimous. There was a bit of grumbling from the old conservative guard, perhaps at first. But everyone had to honestly admit that it is only through better uh, communication that we would have a unified effort towards preserving our rights. Now, there were two parts to this resolution. One was that Virginia should form its own committee of correspondence. And the second was that the Speaker of the House of Burgesses should write to the other colony, colonial assemblies and ask them mm -hmm. to do the same. Could you tell us about that work to form a committee of correspondence here in Virginia and to ask your fellow colonies to do the same? Our committee here in Virginia had uh, well nigh of 20 different members. And the chairman of the committee was Mr. Peyton Randolph, who at the time was the Speaker of the House of Burgesses. Universally uh, liked and trusted and respected and it was he who took it upon himself to write other speakers throughout the rest of um, colonial America to, uh, to urge them. Do you recall if the other colonies followed Virginia's lead? Oh yes, eventually all did, uh, especially New England at first. They had, after all, suffered the brunt of, uh, of British tyranny more than uh, we in the, uh, in the southern reaches of the continent. So uh, we heard almost immediately from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut. Um, Pennsylvania was the last. I'm really glad you brought up New England, Mr. Henry, because in the history books, there is a bit of a debate, and really I would call it a competition, between New England and Virginia to be first. <laughs> so many of these history books say that it's really Samuel Adams and the Boston Committee of Correspondence that started the Committees of Correspondence Network. And the other half of the history books say, no, it was in fact Virginia and it's March 12, 1773 resolution that called for the colonies to unite and form the Committees of Correspondence. I'm curious what your take on that debate or competition is. That very healthy competition betwixt New England and Virginia has um, been steadfast since before the revolution. I know Mr. Adams quite well. We served at the first Congress together, part of the second. And he was certainly no stranger to committees of correspondence such as this. Um, as early as the time of the Stamp Act, for example, the towns and villages of Massachusetts Bay formed such committees to uh, correspond with Boston, the, uh, the center point uh, of uh, the dissemination of information. Uh, so in that way, uh, New England does have, have uh, the right of it. And yet, uh, in, in calling for an intercolonial system of committees of correspondence, that uh, occurred here in the Raleigh Tavern in Virginia. So both Massachusetts and Virginia have a first in that Massachusetts formed committees of correspondence to correspond across the Bay Colony, but Virginia called for committees across the 13 mainland colonies to communicate with each other. Quite so. How did the committees of correspondence network work? Did you just put letters in the mail with news and other information? Were you communicating some other way? Some of our mail was uh, transferred throughout the postal system, which had been in place already for 20 years or more. Uh, but there was some sensitive information, too, that had to travel by way of uh, trusted couriers. We were uh, delighted with the speed uh, with which we were receiving information from such places as Boston and Philadelphia. Yeah, what was the speed? How long would it take from a message to get from the committee here in Williamsburg to say Philadelphia, New York City, or Boston? Uh, from Boston, it was commonplace to receive word in as little as 17 days. We were astonished uh, to learn of blood being spilled at Lexington Green only 11 days after the fact. Remarkable, when you consider that's a distance of some 650 miles in a four mile an hour world and the fact that there were no real good roads that linked the colonies together. And uh, river crossings that had to be made. One was constantly at the mercy of the ferrymen. Now, Mr. Henry, we are now 
250 years removed from your work to establish the Committees of Correspondence Network. When you look back on your work in 1773, what do you make of it? Did the committees live up to what you'd hope to accomplish with them? Absolutely. The Committees of Correspondence were essential in uh, rallying spirit uh, towards eventual independence on the political side and then on the military side too. Whereas General Washington was not a member of the Committee of Correspondence per se, he was receiving frequent information uh, from all of the various states' committees uh, that uh, had much to do with our eventual victory at the town of York. Mr. Henry, thank you so much for taking the time to answer our questions today. And thank you for your work on the Committees of Correspondence. My very great honor. Thank you.